You're listening to the New Hope Church podcast. To learn more about what we're doing on the south side of Indianapolis, you can check us out online at becomehope.com. If you like what you're hearing here, be sure you check out one of our companion podcasts. We have a daily devotional podcast called Let's Find Out Together, as well as an apologetics podcast called Salty Saints. Let's listen in as today's talk comes from Randy Spade. Thank you so much for choosing to spend part of your busy day here with us as we worship the Lord. We've been involved in a sermon series that is taking us through uh, the second part of the book of Matthew, where Jesus has a lot to say about discipleship. Now, so far, we've seen that disciple makers have true faith. We've seen that they are to be humble. We've seen that they're accountable. Last week we saw that they forgive. Now, Jesus used the child uh, sort of as an object lesson in one of uh, the, the teachings, the sermons that he gave. Let's go back and let's look at that passage. Uh, in, in that teaching, Jesus said, so anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Great, great. So we see there that the child was lowly. The child was humble. And we're to be humble like the child. Then we come to today's passage. And there are children involved in that as well. One day, some people brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded them. They scolded the parents for bothering Jesus. When Jesus found out, he said, Nah, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. The kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And then he placed his hands on their heads. And he prayed for them and he blessed them before he left. Now we look at that. It's a really simple passage and we read it, and, and to be honest with you, I get it. If I had been around Jesus, I might have been with the disciples saying, eh, you know, you guys can catch up to him later, but uh, he's busy right now. He's, uh, he's teaching right now. This is a public forum. We, uh, we want to make sure that we do the right things here. The disciples thought that Jesus was too busy to waste his time on little kids. They took it on themselves to try to chase them away. Jesus, however, thought differently. He didn't have that same perspective. He didn't see children as a waste of time. Instead, he saw them as examples. Let the little children come to me. The kingdom of heaven belongs to people like these children. Now, again, just like the past time, we're left to kind of wonder what it is that Jesus actually meant. Matthew actually gives us a clue to what he means a couple of paragraphs later. It's in the next chapter. Jesus is leaving Jericho. He's surrounded by a large crowd, but there are two men in the outskirts of Jericho. Two blind men. Now, he is probably leaving the city gates. There was uh, generally only one or maybe two ways in and out of a city. So beggars would sit there because anybody coming in and out would have to go through one of these gates. So the guys are there and they hear Jesus coming and they start to shout. As Jesus and his disciple left the town of Jericho, a large crowd followed behind. Two blind men were sitting beside the road. When they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. 
And the crowd yelled at them, shut up, be quiet, go away. He doesn't have time for you. They only shouted the louder. Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Now, we're going to look at that passage later. Today, it's enough to know that that verb, when it says the crowd yelled at them, that's the very same verb that occurs in the passage that we're looking at. When it says that the disciples scolded the parents. The disciples yelled at the parents, said, leave them alone. The crowd yells at the two, be quiet. He's busy. He doesn't have time for you. In both sections, the disciples kind of assume that Jesus is like the other religious leaders. The other religious leaders wouldn't have taken time to attend to little kids coming up to them. They might have said, hey, talk to my, uh, talk to my secretary. We'll set up a time for me to come to your home. The disciples thought the kids were below Jesus. The crowd thought the two blind men were below Jesus, beneath him. Why should he waste time on them? Jesus says you got to be like these kids if you want to be part of the kingdom of God. What in the world was he saying? You know, I'm a great believer in context. I'm a great believer in that what he was talking about, we can actually find right in this passage. And if we look at the passage, this one, and if we look at the passage that we're going to study in a couple of weeks about the blind men, they shared one common factor. Very simply, they wanted to be with Jesus. That's all. That's it. The children wanted to spend time with Jesus, and the disciples chased them away because they didn't think that he wanted to spend time with them. And Jesus says, how silly is that? They want to be with me. Don't chase them away. Let them come. If they want to be with me, I want to be with them. And he took time right there in front of the whole crowd. And he spent time with the children. Now, you know, that's a characteristic of kids. Kids want to be with their parents. They really do. And they look for the absolute worst times to let their parents know that they want to be with them. Generally, when you're home after a long, busy day at work, tired, sitting in an easy chair, uh, watching the news, reading the paper, and your child will come up and say, Daddy, and you ignore them. Daddy, Daddy, I've had a child crawl up in my lap, grab my ears, and look me in the eyes and say, Daddy. <laughs> Kids love to be with their parents. They crave that. Especially, especially when they're small children. I looked up on the internet looking for some sort of factual data, some statistics, some surveys about spending time with children, I found out that there are really no conclusive studies. There really aren't. All we get are general impressions, certain concepts. 
Everybody agrees children do want to spend time with their parents. And everyone agrees it's important for parents to spend time with their children. Make time. Spend time with them. We talk about quality time. Sometimes I think we talk about spending quality time because we don't have a lot of time to spend with our kids. And so we say, well, we'll make it quality time. One of the studies I saw said, yes, children need quality time and they need a lot of it. So spend a lot of quality time with your children. Do things that they want to do. Discard other things so that you have time to spend with your children. But this morning, we're not really talking about spend time, spending time with our kids. We're talking about spending time with Jesus. Children wanted to spend time with Jesus. He answered by saying, I want to spend time with them. Two blind men coming out of Jericho had a request. They said, Jesus, please have mercy on us. And he took time to spend with them caused me to start thinking, how is it that I spend time with Jesus? And so I looked, I thought about things that I do to spend time with Jesus, things that were significant to me, things like music. Good music helps me spend time with Jesus. And I'll be honest, I'm old. Um, I like some of the old hymns. I like organ music. Somehow that just puts me in a mood that I'm really receptive to what the Lord has to say. I like nature. Uh, being outside, seeing God's creation, it's like it draws me closer to Him. I like reading the Bible. Private prayer. These are things that draw me closer to Jesus. Ways that I spend time with Jesus. Meditating on Scripture. Not just meditation. It's not just clearing your mind and thinking of no nothing, but thinking specifically about what Scripture says. I love that. Every morning, I listen to my own podcast. I read the scripture for the podcast, and then I listen to it as I drive to work because there's something calming about hearing God's word. I like reading good books, Christian books, and I love to read the old ones. And I don't mean the ones written in 1990. I mean the ones that are written by the fathers of the early church, first century, second century, seeing what they were dealing with and, and reading through their sermons, what they wrote. It, it just helps me to concentrate more on the Lord Jesus. But you know, I asked around last week, I went into the gift class before they got started. And I asked, how do you spend time with Jesus? And I love the answers because they reminded me that it's not just about what I do alone. They told me how important the role of others are in spending time with Jesus. One of the first answers was group Bible study. And that's what they do here. Before we're here together in the sanctuary, they're in a group Bible study back in C23. We're together. They talk about God's word. Many of you are engaged in hope groups, small groups that meet during the week where also you learn about God's word. It's a way to spend time with him. They said, it's important for us to get together and just talk to each other. That is a way to spend time with Jesus. It makes sense if we are his body Spending time with his body is spending time with him. They said eating together. I love that. How many times did Jesus meet around a table, around food? 
and share deep spiritual thoughts. There's something significant about that. Sharing your difficulties with others is another way to spend time with Jesus. Wow. So I don't have to go through what I go through alone. I can talk to others. I can share with others. I can hear from them how they've had similar things in their life, what they did. Praying together. I don't know. I don't know what you do to spend time with Jesus. But you need to find something. Whatever it is that draws you close to Jesus, do it. Because disciple makers love to spend time with Jesus. We need to do it. And we need to do more of it. Today, we don't have disciples to chase us away from Jesus. The 12, they're long gone. They're not standing in front of us. They're not blockading us. They're not saying he doesn't have time for you. There are no crowds around to tell us, shut up, be quiet. He's too busy for you. When we want to spend time with Jesus, we can. Nevertheless, there are some obstacles to spending time with Jesus. Most of those obstacles are not external to us. Most of the obstacles that keep us from spending time with Jesus are right here. They're internal. Vampires do exist in the world that we live in. But the vampires that we fear don't suck our blood. They suck our time. There are time vampires that are waiting there just to take your time away from you. Time that you could be spending with Jesus. But I just got to match those pieces of candy so that they explode on the screen of my cell phone and make room for more pieces of candy that fall from the top. Because if I don't do that, no one else will. (laughs) We all have time vampires. Things that get in our way and we need to find the garlic that chases those time vampires away. Let's identify what it is that keeps us from actually making time to spend with Jesus and get rid of it. One very significant way to spend time with Jesus is through the Lord's Supper. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together today. You know, they practice the Lord's Supper all the way back since the time of Paul, when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he talked to them about how they celebrated the Lord's Supper. Now, it was a great way for the body of Christ to come together, to spend time together with each other, but also to spend time with him. But as Paul talked to them about what they did in the Lord's Supper, He said this. Now, in the following, I can't praise you. For it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church. To some extent, I believe it. But of course, 
there must be divisions among you so that you'll have God's approval. Those who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. Some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. Apparently, their version of the Lord's Supper wasn't just juice and bread, but they would bring a meal, a pitch in. But the rich among them would bring a lot of food and just keep it for themselves. And the poor would have maybe some leftover bread and they would share it just among themselves. Paul says, as a result, some grow hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I will certainly not praise you for this. And then Paul goes on and he shares with them how to celebrate together the Lord's Supper. And he says, when you gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper, first, before you do anything else, examine yourself. Let the Lord speak to you about what there is in your life that you need to get rid of. So let's start by doing that together. We've seen a story from the life of Jesus when he took a child and he set the child in front of them and said, become like this child. All he wants is to be with me. Just be with me. So today, let me ask you these questions. Think about them. Examine yourself. Ask the Lord to help you see yourself as he sees you. First of all, what are some ways that I spend time with Jesus? What time vampires are there in your life that suck away your time so that you have less time to spend with Jesus? What do you need to do to ward off those time vampires? And thinking about that list of things that we looked at, or maybe even some other things, what new way do I want to begin to spend more time with Jesus? Disciple makers love to spend time with Jesus. Make time. You will find that that time becomes some of the most important time that you have during the day. Make time to spend more time with Jesus. In just a few minutes, we're going to come and we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Paul, after he tells them that he doesn't praise them for the way they are celebrating the Lord's Supper, says... I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. Thanks for tuning in to the New Hope Church podcast. If you would do us a favor and like or subscribe on your favorite platform, we would really appreciate it. Also, if you happen to have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at questions at becomehope.com. Have a great week and know that we are praying for you 
as you seek to be Jesus in every corner of your world.